After Babu and uh, Kalyani said what they, what they did, I might sound uh, very strange if I have to say that I'm entirely clear about the objectives of this program. Uh, I'm not. But at the same time, uh, I see the relevance of it. Uh, it's exactly uh, 900 years ago that Magna Carta, uh, which is uh, one of the earliest precedents of, an, you know, of a Eurocentric perspective of human rights, uh, was, uh, was agreed and, and, and signed. Uh, but then if you remember, um, you know, the Magna Carta was signed, was an agreement between the king, King John, and the barons. And uh, the people of England, um, there were already about five million people in, in, uh, in England uh, in, in the 13th century. Uh, we completely, uh, you know, uh, marginalized. They were not part of this particular deal. And in 900 years, uh, though we have uh, materially evolved quite a bit, the socio-political situation almost remains the same. I would, I would want to exemplify on a couple of cases. I would, I'm, I'm called here to sp specifically talk about water, but I would also want to talk from my own praxis on other issues related to IT, democracy. The first is about uh, Aadhaar. Um, you, know, um, you know how Aadhaar got evolved uh, and how Aadhaar is getting implemented. And this is despite uh, the Supreme Court order not to make it uh, mandatory. Now, this Aadhaar was again, like Magna Carta, was an agreement between uh, the local elite and the government, and of course, international governments too. And it was pushed upon by the general, on the general masses. So as soon as Aadhaar was announced, we knew uh, the impact of it on the rights of people in India and the the other the, the the case that's that's happening it started in the magisterial court and then the high court and now in the supreme court most of the back end work that was required for this other uh, uh, case was done by us in fact a couple of my colleagues who are who, who, who are here now from actionaid we took on the responsibility not of challenging it directly we can't do that uh, because it would be deemed a political activity and probably our fcra would be cancelled so we, we said we are going to do the back-end work. So we, in fact, used the right to information uh, opportunity and collected all the documents that there were <coughs> in Aadhaar. And fortunate for us, uh, we've, you know, the, the issue of privacy has been sent to the uh, constitutional bench. But the court has very clearly said that it cannot be made mandatory. Right? We know the dangers of it. And a lot of us, I'm sure here, don't have Aadhaars. But nonetheless, we still have um, you know, I had a notice from my school, my children's school, and they wanted uh, other numbers of my children to be uploaded onto something called the pupil pod. And I had to do it by the six. So I had to send them this particular court judgment and tell them that this is not possible and I'm not going to do it. Right? But then it's not, I mean, this kind of decision making is not limited only to Aadhaar. Just look around. You know, the metro project, you know, the the so-called tender show project, and we've got a whole lot of documents uh, to again prove that uh, it is not only a, just a decision between the local elite and the government, and not even the government, not even the elected government per se, just the chief minister, but it has also completely bypassed all democratic structures. So this has become a norm of the day. Smart cities to start with, and then the initiation of it all, the JNNURM where plans were already made, decisions were already made, and then they were, implement, they were forced to be implemented on the state governments. So we, uh, you know, we have been opposing this. We have been theorizing it, but at the same time opposing it on the ground to deepen democracy in, in India. And the latest, of course, is also the, uh, the example of water. Water, as we all know, has always been a source of power. And hence, it has also been a, a source of discrimination. And in our own society in India, we know how people were discriminated, groups were discriminated from accessing water. And we've been working on this for the past 11 years. Acronym sounds really good. Now, we looked into the document and found that this was again an agreement 
between a local NGO and the commissioners of eight urban local bodies around Bangalore. Yeah, and this particular document, and the NGO was, is called Janagraha, and eight urban local bodies, the commissioners had signed this particular document, and the objective of this, the agreement was, it was in, fa in fact placed by Janagraha to the government, Janagra took on the responsibility of convincing people of Bangalore to accept privatization of water. All this is written. And this was, a, this was a, at the time when you had eight urban local bodies around Bangalore. So you have the central Bangalore with about 100 wards. And there were 298 other wards around Bangalore, uh, other, uh, in, in the form of eight urban local bodies. And these urban local bodies in the margins of Bangalore did not have a water supply did not have sanitation. So people were forced you know, to accept a particular project which was being pushed from above. The irony is that in official documents, it was the first time that the word Greater Bangalore was ever used. That was in the place document. So somebody knew that Bangalore will, will evolve into something called a Greater Bangalore. And it coincides with Another agreement between the Karnataka state government and the World Bank in the form of a particular project called uh, Karnataka Municipal Reforms Project, which was saying, I mean, which, which gave about $60 million for the whole of Karnataka. I mean, if you compare it with the total budget of Karnataka, it's hardly anything anyway, $60 million in 2004. And for the pittance that the World Bank was providing to the, to, the, to the Karnataka government, it had a whole list of conditionalities. And one of the conditionalities was to ensure that BWSSP, which is the Bangalore Water Board, would cut down on 10% of its staff members every year for five years from 2004. So by the end of 2009, the plan was to cut down the BWSSP strength by 50%. And these are two parallel processes. One is the place document, the Greater Bangalore dream, and the privatization. And the other was to cut down the strength of BWSSB by half. So the Greater Bangalore idea was wanting to imagine and materialize a Bangalore which was four times its original size. So Bangalore, which was 200 square kilometers, was to become 800 square kilometers. But parallelly, there was another structure, there was another agreement, which was saying that we will cut down the strength of BWSSP, which, which services, which operates and maintains water, you know, water and sanitation service for the whole, whole city by half. So what was happening? There was a very deliberate attempt by people, by l local elites, along with, um, I mean, this is a direct agreement signed between the World Bank, the international financial institutions, so you're essentially coming back to the same situation that, was, that existed in 12th century England. Yeah? So, and, and th that's how this whole quest for water democracy was, in, was initiated. And we found out that this whole program was being done under the guise of implementing a policy. Now this is very important because policies are becoming new laws. Policies themselves, see policy uh, is not justiciable. It need not necessarily be discussed and debated in, in a legislative assembly. It can be done by, the, by, by, by bureaucrats. And the laws remain, but policies contradict the law but still get implemented. So unless somebody researches, somebody understands this, comprehends the whole thing, puts one thing and the other, and then go, goes to court, it might actually not function. So this particular policy on water was done in 2002. And we got to know that this was done by one single bureaucrat. And I usually use this term super bureaucrats. This is not the general DC level bureaucrat, but somebody at the secretary level, you know, and uh, principal secretary level. And this, and I would want to quote the first line from that particular policy. It was called, the, the water policy itself was called the Urban Drinking Water and Sanitation Policy of 2002-2003, done by a single bureaucrat in two days. Yeah. The policy says, 
the, this policy has been done to ensure, and you, you please identify the contradiction there in this particular sentence. This policy has been done to ensure universal access to water. And then it goes on to say, for the kind of water that people need and are willing to pay for. Yeah? So this, and, and you know, once these policies get made, the implementing mechanism gets brutally bureaucratic. So you can, if you want river water, treated water for your swimming pool, and if you're able to pay, pay for it, if you're willing to pay for it, you can fill up your swimming pool. But next door, if you have a family which cannot afford to pay for water to drink, they will not get water. And this discrimination is in a way legal. So what is legal is not necessarily just. And so you can see that the current water policies in India are essentially an extension of the discriminatory practices around water and sanitation that always existed in India. It is just a new form. I would, I would um, briefly describe the three main points around which um, you know, the, the present water reforms um, are being implemented. The, f the first one is the use of this uh, you know, scientific knowledge to say that there is water scarcity. Five more minutes. Water scarcity. This is very deliberately used, you know, because when we talk about scarcity, immediately it talks about, I mean, it, it relates to the larger environmental agenda. But policy-wise, it makes policy prescriptions very secular. Very secular. Yeah? So, and, but if you look at the actual policy propositions, they use scarcity as an excuse, but they don't talk about augmenting water resource anywhere. So you have all our lakes getting filled up, encroached upon, and there's no one to care. And that's the other issue that we're working on very directly. And we have immense experience on that. What they actually talk about when they, talk, when, when they mention water scarcity as an excuse is to ensure that our water services are managed better. So it becomes managerial. So, you know, there is, so this water scarcity is a very secular excuse which leads to a legitimate domination of a certain dogma. That's one, one uh, part of this triad. The second part is this proposition of the water sector reforms as part of the larger reform, urban reforms process in India, which equates, and I think this is extremely dangerous because we're discussing human rights now, which equates, or not just equates, it says human rights, capitalism, and democracy are compatible. And in fact, it goes on to say that they are not only compatible, that each of them require each other for them to sustain themselves. So if you want human rights, you need to be in a capitalist society. Yeah? And if, it is, if a society has to be democratic, it has to be necessarily capitalistic. So there's no democracy according to their proposition in any other socio-economic society. So it's, an, it's a very well-calculated ideological push. And the third point, which is also very, uh, um, you know, um, dangerous is, you know, they actually prepare uh, records, they have scientific studies, and we, we know that all kinds of scientific studies and, you know, the, the, the cumulative experience of engineers, of planners, nothing worked in Chennai. We know that, right? But still, if you look at their argumentation, they are not discussed and debated, but if you look at their argumentation, it is almost like it is, you know, a creation of new regimes of truth, that this is truth, and this is the way forward. Metro is the way forward. There's absolutely no alternative. And these regimes, of the creations of new regimes of truth is reaching a very serious level of normalization in a society. And the same regimes of truth are implemented just not in one place, everywhere across the South, the global South. And there it takes the form of traveling rationalities. So it, become, it becomes a traveling rationality, the same kind of truth. But then, even if 
this fails, it gets implemented nonetheless. Look at the other experience. Yeah. So empirically, so these this is the, the, the these are the three points around which the water sector reforms are being promoted today, and all the three are extremely dangerous even for the context that you know for for which this particular org program was organized. But empirically, there has been a divergence because privatization has failed. Privatization of water has failed. But at the same time, if you look at the Bloomberg index, you can see water companies in the world today are making more profits than companies that deal with gold and diamond. So water is hot. As a, as a financial consultant said, water is hot. Right? So, but empirically it has failed. The quality has come down extremely badly and the cost of operation has gone up. Mysu was an example, and because of this em empirical divergence, the people of Mysu got together, and I was also part of it. It took us eight years for us to reverse this particular privatization process in which the entire water services in Mysu, in fact, Mysu was the first city where the entire water service was privatized, was handed over to Tata's in 2008. And when it was handed over, it happened again through you know, a, a preordained plan, the JNNURM, the Jawaharlal Nehru National Urban Renewal Mission. And when the proposal came, the DC sat on it for seven months because the, council, the elected council was in place. After the elected council got dissolved, he waited for seven months. He, after the six days after the council got dissolved, he exercised his executive powers and signed this document to privatize Mysore and hand it over to Tatars. Economically, it costed us five times more than how much the, than how much the government used to spend when it was in public hands. But the most serious issue is about democracy. Because you can see how these projects are being implemented with absolutely no, no knowledge. In fact, no consultation with elected representatives. It is happening all across across India and the global south, of course. And Mysore is the closest example that we can talk about. Hence, people got together and they said, our fight for water is not just fight for water, but it is, to, it is a fight to protect democracy in India. And I propose this before I end, that human rights is, in fact, you know, it's extremely important. But if you look at, I mean, if you do a praxeological study of how reforms, current reforms are being uh, promoted in India, it will definitely have an impact on human rights, and it is already having impact on human rights. And we need to take this issue very seriously and um, try to understand each program, each uh, project that is being implemented with an extremely critical understanding of what they are, what, what they are and what they can end up doing to our own lives and to people around us. Thank you.